Greetings. I'm Helen Hudson, president of the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County, Indiana. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our December 2020 virtual lunch with the League about Crawfordsville's urban forests. This is our ninth production online in this unusual year. We invite you to inform yourselves about other public policy issues and topics of interest and concern we've covered by visiting our webpage, our Facebook page, and our YouTube channel. Just type League of Women Voters in Montgomery County into that Google line and you will get there. Lunch with the League is a monthly forum designed to inform the public about issues of community concern. Often these issues are of state and national importance as well, as is certainly is the case with today's environmental program. I'm calling it informally Crawfordsville's Urban Forest, 4,116 trees and counting. <laughs> Since our pandemic hit, Lunch with the League has covered a wide range of topics as varied as the COVID pandemic, voting safely, living in rural Indiana as a Wabash urban student of color, vote by mail Indiana, forest farming, Black Lives Matter, and more. It is our pleasure to continue the environmental strand of our programming today by looking at our urban forest here in Crawfordsville. <clears throat> At this time, I would like to introduce our guests for today. Our guest speaker is Sue Lucas, director of Crawfordsville Main Street and longtime advocate for community improvement. Sue is a leader in many sustainable projects that have and do continue strongly to enhance our community. She is, for instance, the main force behind sustainable initiatives of Montgomery County, whose main showcase program is our community garden, located on Highway 47, just south of town. The community garden is now in its 10th or 11th year. Sue and her husband, Jeff, also brought our community the Rain Barrel Project several years ago. This initiative transformed many a MoCo backyard into a rain cashment facility. Please visit the Main Street website to see the many, many other community projects that Ms. Lucas leads as Main Street Director. We are delighted to have her here with us today to talk about the city's urban forests, a program she initiated in conjunction with our stellar project designation in 2017. Welcome, Sue. We are so honored to have you with us today. Good morning, Helen. Also Thank you for having me here. Oh, you're so very welcome. We're delighted to have you. Also joining us today is questioner Dr. David Pauley. Dr. Pauley is a retired professor of biology and genetics at Wabash College. He brings professional expertise as well as deep interest in the field of urban forestry. David is also a member of the Crawfordsville Tree Committee. Welcome, David, and thank you very much. Thank you for Good. having me, Helen. <laughs> thank you. Our second questioner today was to be Mr. Tom Klein, newly appointed Montgomery County Administrator. Tom comes to us from Avon, where he was town manager, where he oversaw the designation of Avon as Indiana's first Tree City USA. Alas, at the last minute this morning, Tom learned that his bosses had scheduled a business call for this very time. For those of you watching this broadcast, I'm glad to let you know of the special expertise of Mr. Kleins and encourage you to welcome him to our community and to follow his work as it develops. We'd also hope to have with us today someone I'd also like you to keep your ears out for, and that is Arborist Belinda Kiger who currently serves as Main Street Board President. Belinda comes to our community also with tremendous expertise. She is a trained arborist who worked for Tree Lafayette in urban, as an urban forestry advisor. Her group oversaw the four phases of Lafayette's tree inventory with Belinda as the consultant. We will be glad also everyone to meet her and welcome her into this community of those who love urban trees. 
And last but not least, I'd like to introduce you to Marco Dees, cornerstone of our Lunch with the League programs, both real and virtual. Marco coordinates Lunch with the League speakers and is also production manager and editor for these virtual programs. No small task. He also loads the programs onto our various social media platforms. Thank you, Marco. Also, I should note that this program concludes Marco's year as coordinator of Lunch with the League, and we cannot thank him enough for this public service. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's been such a joy to watch this program develop and become so important in our community. It has given the League of Women Voters a, a platform into a wider community, and we are entirely grateful. There are so many people who go, wow, League does that? Oh, oh, that's, that's good. I should be a member of League, right? I mean, so you were marketing for League as well as doing this fabulous community service, and we thank you. Virtual Lunch with the League programming will resume in February under the direction of its incoming coordinator, Shelby Hoover, who may also bring a new co-director with her. The League of Women Voters of Montgomery County and the public thanks you all. So welcome everyone. And now it is my delight to turn today's program over to Ms. Sue Lucas. Thank you, Sue, for taking the time to make this presentation in this very, very busy season. We so appreciate thank, it. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Marco, for inviting uh, Carpentersville Main Street to come here today and, and share about the, the progress in urban forestry here in Crawfordsville. Greatly appreciate this opportunity. Um, so I have a little presentation here, and I believe uh, uh, David Polly will have some questions and maybe some observations as well, since he was uh, one of the, uh, the the folks who began on our tree committee that began in January of 2017. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, the first slide here, and there's the ginkgo in front of uh, Jerry Smith's Green Street uh, Gallery, uh, and it's a recent. Uh, newcomer to, to our town. But we're gonna to talk today about helping to revitalize uh, our community's urban canopy. So let's go to history then to talk about what that means. What's, what do we mean when we say revitalize? So here's a picture of 200 East Main. Around 1918, you can see horses, you can see the interurban. Uh, tracks that went down uh, that are heading west down Main Street. If you look closely, you recognize the building there on your on your right. And Four Seasons, Top Line Athletics, all right there. But what do we see in this uh, Midwestern town? What we're not seeing, unless you were to look well back, uh, is trees. And of course, the development of uh, towns in the Midwest uh, in the 1800s and, uh, and into the 19th, uh, 20th century, uh, there's just a lot of clear cutting going on uh, to build spaces. We went from uh, log buildings in the downtown area uh, to the first brick and mortar buildings around 1870. And these rapid, with the construction of these buildings and sidewalks and other types of infrastructure, there just wasn't room for trees. But trees started getting planted. Once that, that time of rapid development in the downtown core, especially, uh, was quieting down, well, let's plant some trees. And here's a picture of the courthouse around 1920. And you can see some trees there. Maybe you're familiar with some other pictures that show these trees around the courthouse. And maybe if you look closely, you'll be able to see what species that they are. Let's go to the municipal building, which was built uh, in 1933 to replace the, uh, the old city building that was on North Green Street. You see the same kinds of trees right there. Who wants to guess what these are? 
beautiful vase shape trees. Are they elms? They are American elms. So there you see some American elms around the courthouse and you can see them there. And I, su I suspect when you look well back there uh, into West Main, you'll see some elms too. Well, so let's talk about elms for a second because it, they provide a great lesson for all of us uh, about the uh, hazards of uh, monoculture planting. So during uh, post-World War I residential development, elms were planted along pretty much every boulevard they could be planted along. They're durable, they grew rapidly. So these trees that were planted here in the municipal building uh, in the 30s grew pretty rapidly and so that they were nice mature trees uh, within 10, 15 years. Cities had hundreds of thousands of these uh, boulevard elms and many of them named streets after the elm too. Pretty much every town has an elm street in it, doesn't it? Um, houses, yards, the street tree, the elm tree was almost part of the definition of the American dream. Well, in 1931, with all of this building boom going on, especially in residential areas, a uh, Ohio furniture company unwittingly brought infected uh, logs from Europe, which was under its own pandemic of Dutch elm disease at that time. And Dutch elm disease then entered uh, the United States. It did not take long for it to uh, sweep throughout the country. Uh, just like those European trees, uh, this disease, which was not a Dutch disease, but an Asian disease uh, discovered by a Dutch botanist, uh, this disease, uh, our American elms, the European elms had no resistance to it. And so it didn't take long for it to, to just blow through our American landscape. So that by the end of the 20th century, over 40 million American elms had succumbed to that disease. Uh, so what, besides taking out our trees, it affected our culture uh, significantly. It, it changed the way we view monoculture planting, uh, our understanding of invasive species. It altered or, or perhaps created urban forest, forestry policy and law. And it changed the public's uh, awareness of street tree management. In fact, today's current emerald ash borer, the EAB, uh, past that's taking out all of our ash trees uh, is directly linked to Dutch elm disease as the majority of today's ash trees were planted as replacements for the elm. So we didn't learn too quickly, but we're learning now about the importance of diversity. We also had this lesson thrown in. So as all the elm trees came down in our city streetscapes, uh, that was about the time that the calorie pear species and its different cultivars became really popular both in uh, streetscapes and in the home landscape. The calorie pear, what you see here is a couple of examples of Bradford pears, um, seemed to be the ideal tree. They were tough, durable, could take whatever an ur urban landscape would throw at it, uh, salt, high winds, heat, you name it, they could take it. Uh, and of course, they have uh, pretty white flowers in the springtime, uh, provide some shade in the summer, and then in the fall, that brilliant Bradford pear uh, coloring for fall, autumn color. Uh, but it's one of those too good to be true type situations. The, the calorie pears proved to be a lesson in what not to plant. Uh, for one, it, it wasn't too long before it was found that these trees were invasive species. And uh, because they were planted so prevalently, uh, 
they began to, and they provide those little sea, uh, fruits uh, at the end of the summer. Well, birds love them, and so birds distribute those. And uh, if you drive uh, on Highway 231 is a great example. Uh, head out north of town and head to Lafayette and you'll begin to see in after all the other trees have dropped their leaves in the fall, you'll see uh, these uh, pretty red and orange trees uh, gracing both uh, sides of the road. Well, those are calorie pears that plant, got planted by birds and they are taking over our natural forest. You can see them also in the springtime when they flower. Pretty white flowers, that means you have serious problems. And just in the few years that I've been studying these things, it's alarming the amount of uh, uh, in, invasion uh, that the calorie pear is doing to our roadsides and to our forests, natural forests. Uh, calorie pears also, as you can see, now this is an example of a tree that was uh, topped and hat racked. We're going to talk about that in a second. And so you have this massive, thick, almost this big shrub uh, sitting there on, on the street. Um, it's not doing really much good there. Uh, so uh, we had all of the calorie pears and the, the ones that survived in the downtown uh, thinned a couple of years ago, and we're working on ways to replace them. These trees were a lesson in uh, what not to plant and a lesson in uh, just having a, a management plan in place for what you want, where you want to go in urban forestry. So well-intended, uh, and they last for probably a good 20, 25 years, but uh, because the complaints of birds inhabiting those trees, which then creates those other things that birds do, uh, the trees got cut down. Uh, that's a problem with these Bradford pears is because they hold onto their leaves so long, the birds love them. And they, when they flock in the fall, they head to those Bradford pears and create a, a lot of mess. So they came down, leaving Crawfordsville, downtown Crawfordsville, with those, two, those uh, squares that you see, which are just empty, or there are still some stumps there. And those are gradually being removed, uh, re replaced with new hardscape, and we hope, new trees. So that's a little bit of the history. So we're going to fast forward uh, to uh, August of 2015 when the city of Crawfordville was named an Indiana Stellar designee. This was opening up a brand new chapter for the city of Crawfordsville. Uh, Placemaking was understood to be a very important part of where communities wanted to go. Uh, back in the, in the aughts uh, and, and early 2010s, uh, communities were, were struggling from those uh, economic downturns and recessions. There was no, um, no resources to, to, uh, to, to assist with uh, that type of economic development that was uh, tar uh, the target being uh, quality of life. There were more pressing matters, but now we have this brand new uh, lease called the Stellar Grant or the Stellar Designation, which enabled our community to uh, be assisted by state and federal resources to work on our stellar projects. When Mayor Barton was elected in 2011, one of his main objectives, if you go through the archives, was improving the quality of life in our community. So, uh, the city uh, made several uh, attempts at applications, but in 2015, I, I think it was just providential that that was the sweet spot. That was the year we were really supposed to get it. Um, so most of the city's placemaking stellar projects involved some measure of tree planting. So tree management knowledge was gonna be really important to ensure sustainable outcomes. 
In 2016, Corporatesville Main Street was asked to serve on the Stellar Advisory Committee. Uh, we recognize that to be ready for significant numbers of city-sponsored tree plantings uh, and the management of those, there was a need to begin learning these uh, practices together with, with city services, with those department heads in an intentional and methodical way. We had Pike Place, we had the Downtown Trail, and we had the Philip Q. Michael Trailhead, which all involved a significant amount of trees. So in order to go uh, from, from this, to this new conception meant we had to uh, start learning. We wanted to, uh, you know, these conceptual drawings are always get everyone really excited, but uh, what we have learned is when you look at these beautiful conception drawings, you start to do the math and see the, the amount of resources, time, energy, manpower, uh, all of that that goes into make, keeping that grass looking nice, uh, keeping those trees looking nice, li limbed up, lifted up, and, and pretty. So we uh, wanted to start learning, and so now Crawfordsville Urban Forestry was actually a thing because of 2015. Mm -hmm. So we started meeting uh, in 2017, the Stellar Advisory Committee, but uh, off to the side, there was another team meeting, uh, and this was uh, a group of Crawfordsville High School students who were gathering to craft their vision for their city. Uh, Plan Director Brandy Allen, with assistance from uh, Ball State University and Indiana Housing and Community Development Administration, met with students uh, in 2016 to work on this project, My Community, My Vision. They did, they did their research, they interviewed their classmates and uh, polled them for what types of things would you like to see happening in your community? What are we lacking? Where do you, if you wanna stay here, what are the kinds of things that you would like to see? So their report was finally presented uh, in a public forum in April, 2017. Now this was just a few months after uh, the Crawfordsville Tree Committee uh, under the umbrella of Crawfordsville Main Street began to meet. But I just absolutely wanna focus on what these students did for a moment. So after they had uh, gathered all of their data and crunched it into a report, they presented a number of goals uh, in that report of things that they were suggesting to the city that they would like to see happen. And the first one on their list that was at this public forum, I don't remember if Helen, if you were there or not, it was, I, a, it, it was a terrific event. Yeah, yeah. So they, they throw up their first goal that was to improve, enhance the main thoroughfares in Crawfordsville. Now you and I might say, get after those potholes, right? Um, but also wanted to decrease noise pollution for pedestrians. Are we beginning to see where they're headed? Their first initiative, number one, overwhelmingly, was Main Street Trees. Mm -hmm. What did they want to do? Plant and restore, there's that word, restore, revitalize street trees along uh, the main corridors, especially along Washington and Market Streets. Um, they did their research. They understood that the planting of street trees uh, creates a physical buffer between the sidewalk and the street, and it helps reduce the amount of air and noise pollution. It makes those, those busy thoroughfares safer for pedestrians. It makes the downtown more attractive, both for the youth and visitors and everyone else. So they suggested partnering with Crawfordsville Main Street, Flower Lovers Garden Club to get some more containers and the uh, Tree Commission 
um, that uh, Main Street initiated. They suggested creating an inventory of existing street trees. I was just amazed at these guys and um, recommended that we work with Purdue uh, Extension and the Natural Resources uh, Urban Forestry Program under uh, our Indiana Department of Natural Resources. They uh, gave some examples here of uh, street trees that could work and why. <laughs> so we were just, uh, I was pickled that day. Um, and then as I talked to some of the, the folks afterwards, I remember those who attended, just to kind of feel out, uh, so what did you think about that? Do you think this could work? And what I was seeing was kind of the, the, the remnant of the Bradford, the ghost of the Bradford pears was still hanging around because it was like, well, trees bring birds and, and that means problems. And I'm like, oi, <laughs> well, yeah. we, we need to work on that. We need to work on um, these specters of, of why, you know, we tried that and it didn't work. And, and let's get some education out there. Let's all learn together about, you know, maybe if you don't plant thick, bushy trees, uh, that hang on to their leaves through January, <laughs> maybe you won't have as many uh, birds. Maybe if you prune them properly, that would also help. And planting the right species, very primary. So let's get to learning. And that's what we did. The uh, initial exploratory tree committee met first time January. And I am so tickled. If you look at that slide at the top there, the folks who uh, participated in that. We had so many department heads, uh, street department, parks department, planning department, CELP. Uh, we had city council uh, persons serving on this, uh, on this committee, as well as the city's uh, uh, Dale Petrie, the city administrator. We had input from Tim Riley from Wabash College, Deb King from Blue Wallace, ISA Arborists, Nathan Hill and Aaron Flint, uh, terrific. So we studied, those, those first few meetings were studying how trees are an investment in economic development and their positive influence on property values, quality of life, community wellness, and in particular, getting that highlighter out, investor and visitor perceptions. So we're working very hard, Stellar is working very hard to attract people to this community. Trees assist with that, but they must be well managed. We understood if they're to be well managed, we must then begin to work together to learn how to do that. So let's create a proactive program and not a reactive program. One that's based on let's, let's plan and not just, oh my God, this tree's about ready to fall or it did fall and crush a car or something that would be horrible. Let's, let's find out what we need to do. So uh, reviewing history is, is so important, isn't it? So we went back into and learned about the, you know, the history of uh, urban forestry and or lack thereof in Crawfordsville um, and let's team learn together uh, how to improve on that. So uh, the picture you should be seeing is this uh, sad little street tree up there. And uh, I think the first rule that we uh, embraced and held on to and will always help hold on to is the right tree, right place principle. If you'll notice, this tree is planted in hardscape with curb around it. And I'm not sure how it's supposed to get watered. It has no irrigation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that tree is already probably doomed. And if you look closely there, it's got a, an outlet put in there. I'm not sure that outlet's going to make it either, <laughs> because if water pools in there, it's going to, you know, create those problems. Um, so right tree, right place. Uh, we learned that from the calorie pairs and, uh, and other situations. We learned the, uh, the, the challenge of not having a, a maintenance plan uh, for your trees. Uh, virtually 
everything else, if you watch the uh, Crawfordsville firefighters, for instance, with their equipment, that's very expensive equipment, and you drive by uh, any day of the year and see them out there cleaning and, and inspecting and checking and oiling and, and keeping those things in, in pristine shape, street department does the same thing, uh, county as well, they maintain those things well. They understand them to be an investment. Our trees are an investment as well. So things have to be assessed uh, periodically as well. Uh, we see a lot of tree topping and hat racking prevalent in Montgomery County, volcano mulching too. Uh, a tree that's in a right of way, so here's my yard, there's a sidewalk, there's a tree next to the curb. Is that my tree or is it the city's tree? Who knows? It gets neglected, so that uncertain uh, ownership has caused some issues too. And in that place of hesitancy, uh, in the place of, of uh, some, you know, the specter of the calorie pairs and, and uh, some other uh, things that uh, made people just avoid planting trees. We'll develop, we'll do residential development, we'll do commercial development, but let's just not do trees because they can be a pain. Mm. They, they are a pain when you don't take care of them. <laughs> or if you don't do, right tree, right place. Mm. So then you have in our commercial areas, uh, these wide expanses of, of hardscape and asphalt. Uh, the water goes into, uh, the, the rain, the runoff goes into storm water. Uh, there's nothing there to mitigate uh, that discharge. So you got a planting bed in this image, which could have a tree in it, uh, but you would need to cut away some of that curb and so that it could capture some of that stormwater. But these pictures here, and I mean no disrespect to any business, uh, they're built, these parking lots are built around the Black Friday uh, idea, the paradigm of we want to have parking lots as big as possible for those one or few days of the year when they're full to the brim. Uh, in our downtown, these streets uh, used to have uh, street trees years ago, those elms and, and the Bradford pears, which were nice for a while. And, and the tree and those Bradford pears were planted in a way that they could capture stormwater. But there's a lot of discharge off of these sidewalks downtown. And as it was noted by the, the CHS students, um, we see a, a family here trying to cross to get to the farmer's market. And anybody who stood on those corners understands you have to be very, very careful. Um, cars are not going 30 miles an hour always, and especially if they see that yellow light. But when you plant trees along a boulevard, along a, a street, Trees have a way of naturally making you slow down. Many of us will slow down a little bit because the trees are signaling that there's people and animals nearby. I'm in a neighborhood. I'm not on the highway. So I'm going to be a little more careful. Trees uh, help to calm traffic. They help to quiet traffic. So going to the uh, reference to tree topping and hat racking and volcano mulching. These are not images from Crawfordsville, but we do see quite a bit of this uh, kind of pruning going on. Topping and hat racking is basically you're creating that tree that you saw uh, on uh, that Bradford pear tree on 100 East Main. Uh, the tree uh, is, is significantly damaged. You removed most of its leaf canopy and it's going to struggle uh, to produce new growth. Uh, and on each one of those cuts, it's going to create this hydra effect. You can see it on the image on your, uh, on your left there, uh, where a healthy branch was removed. You now have 15, 20 smaller branches because the tree is, needs to produce food and your basic biology has you recalling that it's leaves that produce 
uh, much of the food for a tree. Uh, volcano mulching, uh, it's just this phenomenon. I don't remember seeing it when I was growing up, but now it's just the thing. It's what everybody wants to do. It was created to make it easier for the mower to get around the tree so that the tree didn't, the trunk maybe didn't get damaged. People think it looks nice, but it's a tree killer, guaranteed tree killer. And so we've been trying to encourage people to please not volcano mulch. And all the trees that we've planted, we'll ask the contractors to, you know, apply it this way and pull that mulch away from the trunk. The mulch damage creates a perfect environment for pests and disease to get into the, uh, the bottom part of that trunk. And too often trees, commercially trees or, or commercial trees are planted too deeply and uh, the, the root flare of that tree is planted too deeply. So when the root flare is planted too deeply and not level with the ground, and then you pile a bunch of mulch around there, what you're gonna have in a few years, you're gonna have a tree that starts to fail and even worse, uh, tough wind comes along and just snaps it right off. So it creates a very hazard situation too. And you've lost a, an attractive shade tree and created um, you know, a safety measure. Dave, do you wanna jump in on that one? Any other comments about these practices? Oh, about um, uh, uh, volcano mulching, which is my pet peeve, and, and the uh, uh, tree topping. Yeah, I, I think um, trees are, are quite an investment. And uh, I think we tend to think that, um, that you don't have to do much with trees after they're put in the ground. So um, they need to be taken care of uh, properly. I think that um, um, that uh, people need to pay attention to how deeply they plant those trees. And uh, you mentioned root flare. I'm not sure folks know exactly what that is, but as you go down the trunk, you'll see the um, the the trunk sort of spread out a little bit as it transitions to the root tissue. And uh, that transition zone is it's important to have it right at the uh, soil level, um, not below and certainly not above. Mm. I don't know if that was helpful or not. That's good, yeah, thank you. So right tree, right place, get a maintenance plan, begin to assess our trees, Watch your uh, tree pruning practices, make sure they're healthy practices and mulching too. Um, let's plant some more trees instead of fewer uh, because we know more now. Uh, well, if we're gonna plant some trees, we need a recommended tree list. And you remember the slide from the, uh, uh, the students, they, they put up there, here's a suggestion of a few trees that could work in uh, particular locations. But what we had coming to bear on us in 2017 was the Green Street Combined Sewer Overflow Project. It was happening now. Um, and new street trees were coming. Uh, Pike Place, uh, which was still an empty lot at that time. The Philip Hugh Michael Trailhead, uh, City Park trees. Uh, many look to be in bad condition. They need replaced. What kind of tree do we put in there? and then trees along the proposed downtown trail. Uh, so, okay, we had a few months to sort of gather and, and maybe talk about important points. And then suddenly Green Street project happened. And it was, instead of ready, set, go, there was just ready, go. And there was no set to it. Mm -hmm. um, the Green Street project happened and uh, suddenly, Oh, well, we have a tree committee, so let's ask them what species should go here. And by the way, we need a tree great, and we need to know exactly the locations where they go. And oh, by the way, if you could help us out with identifying which red brick the city is supposed to use, <laughs> because there was a variety of different red brick going along in those margins. So suddenly we were the you know, the alleged experts. And uh, I've always be, I'll have always be grateful for the city of Crawfordsville for allowing the, the Main Street Tree Committee uh, members to assist with this project because now we have uh, 
lining Green Street, a real Green Street uh, that had uh, only a, that had stumps of Bradford pears and empty uh, Bradford pear spots. Now we have a, just this beautiful array of honey locusts and uh, the ginkgo biloba and the fruitless um, and a Fremonti maple as well. So, uh, and then we would uh, assess those. So they were planted. We had to have the contractors replant a few because they were planted incorrectly. Stakes worked sometimes, not always. And uh, that was a real rainy year too. Uh, and some trees failed, but we got to replace them. So that was great. Anyway, at the, at the end of it, this the picture was taken uh, a little bit later, we have Larry Hunt here and Belinda Kiger from Crawfordsville Main Street. Uh, Larry was, uh, and Belinda were looking at how do we get these trees watered? So that maintenance, we need a maintenance plan. These trees need to be watered. It was really hot that year and they got watered properly. And there was an assignment of who was watering instead of, well, whoever gets there first, who do we throw at this? And that was, you know, meaning no disrespect, but you know, when you're very, very busy and we're a small town and resources are limit, limited, it benefits everybody to know exactly who's doing what. So that was a, a great benefit. Uh, first run, the, the Green Street tree project, part of the combined sewer overflow. And so those terrific uh, tree grades, aren't they pretty? They also capture a lot of that discharge coming from buildings along Green Street. Whoops. So uh, objective one, team learn best practices, which we referenced. We, we got to get a maintenance plan. We need to learn best practices. We need uh, uh, tree lists, recommended tree lists. And so we see Larry here uh, adding water to a, a watering bag, a gator watering bag there at Pike Place. In the lower right, you see a uh, measuring stick there showing just what David was talking about a minute ago, that the root flare of this little uh, star magnolia was planted too deeply by the contractor. And so it needs to be lifted up a little bit or, or have some of that soil and mulch pulled away so that the root flare is exposed and not buried. Uh, and then we see our great parks folks here. Uh, there's Kim and Steve and David, I think, um, replanting a tree that failed at, uh, at Michael Trailhead. Um, it just, it just never made it. It, it because sometimes trees, the, the transplant shock will kill a tree and it never recovers from that. So this is a new tree. And these guys did a marvelous job uh, planting this new tree recently. And then there at the uh, lower lower left, there's that original frontier elm that was planted in front of Barefoot Burger. Boy, we just could not get that thing to not fall over until we found a terrific great stake that worked. And so we now have a vendor. We know exactly the kind of great stake to get to anchor these trees and that that issue solved and everybody all those department heads know exactly where to get that um every once in a while you'll see there at the very top uh pike place uh, tree inspection it was a fourth inspection that i did all the trees are numbered and then they're assessed about every six months for health and and watching for things like damage vandalism and things like that okay Team learning, it continues. Really up until the last few weeks ago, uh, we were approached by a, a Wabash student, God bless him, who said, I wanna plant 16 trees in two weeks somewhere. <laughs> we was, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, can we do maybe eight, you know, and uh, we, we gotta make sure we can pr procure them. There's a lot of steps to that. And so we met on Saturday, November 14th. These pictures were taken at the uh, dog park or right next to it. Um, this beautiful array of uh, Wabash men came out and in, in that top left picture you'll see Belinda showing them how to plant a tree. A tree <laughs> that needs to 
were all containerized trees. So those comes with some special treatment when you go to plant those. And so, you know, these guys might have thought that they were coming to just, you know, we're going to dig some holes, we're going to throw those trees in, and we're going to cover them up, and that's going to be wonderful. Well, they spent about a half hour learning proper planting techniques, and each tree was different, which was a good thing, because those Wabash guys, they, they do love to be tested, uh, and, and they were, and it was great watching them as they pulled one tree out, and it had this, this kind of character to it, and then they pulled another one out of another container, and it had a completely different character, but they took what they had just heard and brought it to bear on making sure that that tree was, was going to have a, a great chance and, and thrive and be there uh, when they can bring their kids in a few years, say, I planted that tree. So that was just a couple of weeks ago. Team learning. And who better to do that with than the men of Wabash? So um, I really want to thank Fawn Johnson and her team at Crawfordsville Parks for very quickly adapting to that request and making sure it happened. Some trees were planted there, also at the Elston Ball Diamonds and uh, at the old Coke plant where the Sugar Creek Canoe Launch is. We hope to do that remaining eight come spring. So the second objective on our uh, new tree committee was to start doing Arbor Day events. And those have been a terrific amount of fun. Hey, D hey David, I, you've been able to be at, at several of them and I really appreciate that. This was one of the first ones done uh, behind Carnegie, great Patriot Elm being planted there. And then here's David. I know this picture seems a little, uh, a little different than what we're used to today, but this mass of, this was host school, right? Yeah. And, and who are the, uh, whoops, and who are the, uh, is that kindergartners? And kindergarten, first grade? kindergarten and first grade, yeah. Yes, and uh, when the teachers opened the doors and all of those kids poured out to gather around to assist with planting this beautiful red oak at Hoes, David was there ready for them to yeah. show them about the proper planting techniques. And uh, it was, I, it'll be one of my best memories ever, that's for sure. It was a lot of fun, yeah. It was, it was. And the kids were excited to be outside, but they paid attention. They were very excited about their tree. And then we took some kids, I think these are Nicholson kids maybe, um, out to the high school and they planted a, another oak tree out there near the uh, pool area, another big beautiful oak. We, we had the, or Scott Hessler had the idea of a legacy tree, and the idea was, I think those are kindergartners, uh, and the idea... Okay, that's right. The idea was that each kindergarten class would plant a tree, and then on graduation, they could visit the tree that they had planted. Yeah. But unfortunately, we were not able to sustain that. I'm not sure why it, exactly. Well, maybe we'll pick it up again. <laughs> I think we should, yeah. I uh, was grateful to the street department for helping to purchase uh, a couple of those trees as well. And last year, we did another round of three trees. These were made possible by a community development grant from the Montgomery County Community Foundation. We planted a tree at the courthouse, so I really appreciate the county commissioners for giving us permission to plant this tree behind the Montgomery County sign there at the corner of Market and Washington. So if you look up there, that top left picture and the fellow in the white hat to the right, that's Dale Milligan. And Dale, when he saw the empty streets having no trees back in the um, 80s, uh, he and a, and a couple of other volunteers assisted in bringing uh, the Bradford Pears to downtown. Uh, and I know he went to no small expense of his own to make that happen. Um, and so we wanted Dale to be here for this new legacy of trees, this new generation of trees, and we were grateful that he was able to participate. Um, and then speaking of legacy, on the right of that, we see some kids planting a, a Tupelo tree 
at Milligan Park to replace a tree that had come down. And there at the bottom, uh, members of the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars, they're on uh, East Market, standing there with their Patriot Elm as it gets planted. And Dale being a veteran of World War II, as were most of these uh, individuals here, uh, it was it was a terrific experience. Again, unforgettable when you're there standing with people in the community with their stories, planting a tree in remembrance of those who uh, gave their all for their country. That tree will always be talking to you, won't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and then this past year, this year, uh, 2020, Arbor Day, April of 2020 was a bit different. Um, we planted two trees. They were quickly done. And the tree that we planted at the courthouse uh, last year was dedicated to the patriots of our country from days gone by, those who went before us. And the courthouse elm, the second one, next to its neighbor uh, in that same lot was dedicated to those who were before us. That is the uh, emergency management and the Montgomery County Health Department, first responders, uh, those who were playing the, the vital role of keeping our community safe um, in the early days of the pandemic. There we see Deb King, a uh, groundskeeper there at Lou Wallace Study, uh, getting ready to roll a new Tupelo tree in. So we planted those two for Arbor Day this year. And then just uh, about five weeks ago, we planted uh, two more trees in the downtown area. The one on the right to replace a small Japanese maple that had been eaten by a squirrel. Our third objective, uh, an inventory. We're talking about maintenance, and if you do maintenance uh, for your vehicle, if you do maintenance for your, your business, for your city department, you got to know what you have, and an inventory is critical. So uh, we want to make sure that we know what we have so that we can know how to uh, do fill-in and take care of any new trees. Uh, so when you have a professional unbiased assessment of your trees, professional meaning you have certified arborists who are providing that information and they're documenting it. Uh, and for the 21st century, it's great in the way things get documented instead of put into binders that sit on shelves. So it, this inventory becomes accessible to, to any. We've got a measurement of our tree species. We do a health and safety evaluation of each tree that's inventoried, and it also provides data for prioritizing next steps. So we look to the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, Community Urban Forestry Division, and their grant program. We made an application in September of 2018. It was a very deep application that Belinda Kiger worked on for many, many months. Uh, we got notice of our award in January of 19, and in late summer of 2019, the inventory began and was completed uh, early 2020 and then uh, published. Our financial partners were Tipmont's Enviro, Tipmont EnviroWatts, who assisted with uh, the cost of the in-kind match for the grant, City of Crawfordsville, a uh, significant investment there, and Crawfordsville Main Street as well. And here we see James and Aaron from Davy Tree Group getting started on the uh, inventory there at Pike Place. They're looking at a couple of, of maples. And if you look closely, you'll see this cool gear that they have. Information does not go on a clipboard. It goes into these cool devices that upload all of the information, uh, meaning what, do we, what kind of a tree do we have here? How big is it? What's its health? What's the benefit that it's providing for this particular space? 
Is it in danger of uh, maybe falling over or is it in great shape? A whole bunch of other things. So all of that information was uploaded into TreeKeeper Suite. And this is a screenshot of that, uh, of what Crawfordsville looks like. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't provide a, a more a virtual experience for you, but I can, I will share the link for how anybody can get to our uh, tree inventory here in a minute. Uh, you can scroll into uh, that mass of green dots, which each represents one of our trees. Uh, yes, it's bordered by the city of Crawfordsville uh, boundaries, but it also includes all of our park spaces. Uh, and we have a lot of park spaces. Mm -hmm. And also the lane place. Uh, we're very grateful that the city of Crawfordsville put uh, added, added lane place to uh, that inventory. So as you said at the beginning, Helen, 4,000 plus trees uh, in, in the city of Crawfordsville right of way in its public spaces and in its parks, including Lane Place. So if you were uh, at Tree Keeper, you'd be able to click on, scroll in, maybe find a tree in front of your house or a tree that you like at Lane Place, click on that dot, like you see here in this next slide, you look in the upper left hand corner you'll see a tree highlighted with a red star and then over to the right you see that identified as a swamp oak okay and all the other trees that are showing up in lane place now tree keeper also identifies stumps to let your community know where a tree has been which is important because you might want to pull that stump and plant another. And it also identifies in many cases, vacant sites where small or medium or large trees may be planted. So that gives us a terrific plan for putting in new trees. So looking at our swamp oak, you'll notice to the right of that box where it says oak, swamp, white, this little eyeball. You click on the eyeball and that'll bring up more information, more specific information about that tree. In the upper right hand corner, you can see some basic information that shows you exactly where that tree is in a Google uh, view, both uh, up top from on high and then also the tree is identified in a street view um, taken by the Davy tree folks. At the bottom of this slide, you will see uh, that the option for the dollar sign has been clicked at the uh, upper right hand corner. And that dollar sign gives you the tree benefits for that swamp oak at Lane Place. It'll tell you that it provides uh, air quality benefits, how much carbon it sequesters, how much stormwater it's capturing, the energy benefits that it's providing to shade lane place, and the property benefits as well. So it's adding in the property value. So if you want to look at a street tree in front of your house, you can see if you're thinking of cutting that tree down because uh, it blocks your view. Um, Look and see what the property value benefits it's, it's providing you. But I will say that uh, this inventory of 4,000 plus trees in, a, in the public, on public property, uh, quickly provided for our city a list of trees that needed to come down right away. There was about 115 trees identified that were um, marked as, as very hazardous. And so that provided the, the punch list for Corporateville Street Department and CELP to begin cutting down those trees to make our community safer. And that saves our community a lot of money uh, because this is being done on a nice day when it's not windy and everybody's safe. The tree is, is safely taken down instead of 
in the middle of a storm at one in the morning. Overtime, safety, all good reasons to have uh, a tree inventory. So to review a uh, video of our tree inventory report, I encourage everyone to go to the city's website and click on the street department page. And you'll find there in red, the words tree presentation. Go to that and you'll see Erin Flint from Davy Tree Group, there she is in a screenshot down there, providing Crawfordsville, Indiana's street park and public property tree inventory results. Uh, it provides the results and the recommendations for what uh, Crawfordsville Main Street could do in the next few years. On that same page at the street department, you can find the tree keeper link. What we were just looking at there, look at any tree in the public right away or in parks here in, uh, in, in the city, uh, just find the highlighted in red city tree report and have some fun learning that, <laughs> how to navigate that. Okay, so as we're getting ready to close here, uh, we, we got the inventory done. We have a management plan done thanks to the Department of uh, Natural Resources grant and the city's investment and our other partners' investment and all of those great city department heads and Mayor Barton who made that happen. And uh, we, we are in way better shape now, even with the pandemic. I've, I'm, I'm so grateful that we were able to get this inventory done before that hit. Um, we also have a long range objective. And that was referred to earlier, uh, Helen, when you were talking about Tom Klein. Uh, uh -huh. I would love to see Crawfordsville Main Street become a Tree City USA. It comes with uh, standards to, to qualify. You have to have a municipal tree department, a, an officially recognized commission. Our committee is not quite that, even though it's populated by a lot of uh, of city uh, workers. So we need that to, to have a little bit more uh, oomph to it. We also need to revisit our city tree ordinance, which is uh, pretty basic and, and like um, probably many communities around the country, something needs to be brought into the 21st century. And we need to show dedicated annual municipal investment to uh, with tree plantings, tree uh, health, pruning, uh, assessments, and, and those kind of things to uh, demonstrate that we're uh, making marked progress in uh, our urban forestry. So like anything, so you know, you're asking for municipal investment, you know, why do that? Especially the question, yeah, it's now 2020 and, you know, look in the future, We've got some economic uncertainty. Is it worth investing money into tree plantings? And the next slide here um, is just one example of uh, why the answer to that question is yes, I would offer. Uh, trees on Main Street, uh, uh, this is the short uh, version of an in-depth report published by the University of Washington they went to a lot of metropolitan sites, urban sites, and studied uh, consumer habits in places that didn't have trees and those that did, and saw that people were willing to drive farther, um, stay longer, spend more money, pay a higher price point on products in spaces that had trees. So trees uh, are a relatively inexpensive way to enhance, to, to cultivate economic vitality in your community. They have a, besides their impact on retail and shopping behavior, they have a positive effect on productivity and on physical mental wellness. They help calm traffic and absorb road noise as we discussed earlier. They clean the air, they cool the space, they make you want to be where they are. Uh, urban forestry has quantitative return on investment 
and it appreciates with age. If I put a bench down in a space, in 10 years that bench, well, I'm gonna see a little rust, I'm gonna see a little this, that, the skateboarders have got to it. But a tree, if it's well cared for, will appreciate with value as it produces more shade and beauty for the, its area. And so we see this in my next slide here, uh, reflected in these uh, snapshots of uh, some commercial historic downtown districts that have trees planted in them. Uh, and you can see it's just an immediate, yeah, let's go there. Um, but instead of going to that place, how about we just work on Crawfordsville and we are, we're seeing more trees planted than ever before. Uh, well, I don't want to say ever before, at least in the 40 years I've been here in our urban spaces, uh, in, in high profile spots that signal to folks, both to the residents and to those visiting and those who are exploring our community for investment, we're on the right track here. We want to, this to be a welcoming area. So uh, in the last, since we, since 2017, David, when we uh, started the tree committee, uh, believe it or not, 90 new trees in just those three years have been planted and 80 of those in urban spaces. Going back to that, that uh, providential stellar designation, uh, that enabled this to happen. In 10 years, as these trees grow, they're really gonna, that the value that they bring to the community is going to do nothing more than grow. So uh, I wanna wrap up here with encouraging everybody, if you wanna assist with uh, urban forestry in our community, in our county, uh, I suggest that you look at the Longview Tree and Green Space Fund that's held at the Montgomery County Community Foundation, which was set up to uh, invest in new plantings and the management of new plantings in our community. Uh, it's said that the uh, best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago and the best, the next best time is like right now. So just make sure it's the right tree and right place and you got a management plan for that even better. Here's some resources on my last slide. Uh, I invite you to come to the fourth floor of Fusion 54, where we have a kiosk set up with uh, information on urban trees, both in, the, uh, in streetscapes and in your own backyard, proper tree plantings. Why should you hire an arborist? Why you don't volcano mulch? And uh, the many benefits of trees. And then there's some others. So, that's my presentation today. I think I went a little bit long, um, but I uh, wonder if there's any questions or comments from any of you. Thank you so much, Sue. David, it looks like you're ready to ask something or say something. Well, yes. So you mentioned a lot about the economic benefit and then just in passing the health benefits. I was wondering uh, if you could uh, elaborate a little more on the health benefits that uh, an urban forest has for the, uh, the residents. Sure. Uh, well, in particular, in the report that Davy Tree provided uh, to the city of Crawfordsville, uh, I'm not talking about the uh, tree keeper site, but this actual physical report, uh, they broke down the, those physical benefits, the wellness benefits. Uh, for instance, uh, almost 7,000 pounds of uh, pollutants are removed from the city of Crawfordsville from those 4,000 plus trees. Um, that's pollution that's not getting into us or getting into our soil or getting into our water. Uh, and speaking of water, uh, incredible, um, almost 7 million gallons of water are kept from going into uh, the storm system. Um, and that's a wellness benefit because when we think about wellness, we must think about all wellness, meaning our soil and our creeks and their tributaries. 
So uh, the, the carbon sequestering, um, making spaces cooler, uh, lots of studies that have been done. You've got a person working inside and you put a tree right outside their window. Uh, that tree in, uh, enhances the productivity, makes them feel better mentally, physically. Uh, throw open the window, breathe in some fresh air made possible by the oxygen producing uh, tree. My son and I were planting trees here on my property this last summer. I've been working from home this year for obvious reasons. And I, I was sure to put one right outside my window for exactly that, uh, that, that reason. I, I, I like to be able to, to look over at my tree, so. And Marco, please tell Sue and David, I was so impressed to learn this in one of our earlier ones that we, well, probably when we were doing Raul, how many trees have you and Melissa planted this year? Oh, this year we probably planted 20. Uh, our, we, we, have, we only have about four acres, but uh, we plant a handful a year usually, and, and this year those at least, yeah, at least 20. Yeah, getting a little forest going out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we put in um, five American hornbeams in our west oh. side of our yard this year. I'm just, they are just, I'm just so thrilled with this. I've been meaning to put a little tree ollie there for the longest time, and it, oh, it's just God. It's the best feeling, and th to use I, I love, I love, the, I love those horn beams, the muscle trees. Yeah. The muscle trees, the ironwood is its other name, as you botanists no. know very well. But uh, they are just delightful. They're babies, but they're just so so lovely to take care of. But, yeah, but Sue, I noticed that you didn't mention uh, Lou Wallace. Do are they not part of that inventory because they do their own, or are they? They are. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Uh, the Lou Wallace uh, Museum and Study Grounds are City Park. I so knew they were. were. Yeah. You so were they emphasizing were, yeah. Lane Place, so I thought maybe Lou wasn't included, but they yes. everything is. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, Lou was definitely included. And I want to say I'm so grateful. Again, I just want to emphasize the city of Crawfordsville for making sure that those two spaces were involved because it helped Larry, Paul Berg, and, and it helped Jill Co. Yeah. To, to know which trees do I need to, do, need to come down right now. And right. just you and me looking at them, we wouldn't be able to tell, but the arborists got in there and they said, you better get these trees down right now. They're beautiful, old, they serve their purpose, but if they come down, it's gonna be bad. Um, and so I believe, uh, Jill was able to, she, the Lane Place was awarded a grant this past summer from the Montgomery County Community Foundation to assist with the removal of those trees. So that's, that's urban forestry is, is getting the trees out of there that are mm -hmm. cause problems. So, and then right. knowing, knowing what you need to plant. The uh, inventory provided let us know that, uh, which is no surprise, like most communities, we have a lot of maples. We have maybe 35% maple population here. And so let's work on our diversity and plant more hop horn beans and other mm -hmm. native species. Mm -hmm. Cool. So regarding the uh, tracking and inventory process, is it possible to track the, the, the ones that weren't intentionally planted? Uh, maybe the, the birds are planting or, or perhaps a well-meaning uh, citizen uh, planted one in, in a place they maybe they shouldn't have. How is that uh, tracked? Are there people looking for those? That's, a, that's another uh, great observation and question. So we had to make a decision of where the tree keeper uh, suite would be housed. What department would house that inventory and make sure that it was updated when uh, trees came down and when new trees were planted. <laughs> And so shout out to the Crawfordsville Street Department, uh, headed up by Scott Hessler and Rhonda, no, I'm sorry, Heather, uh, who's there, who um, sat in on the Let's Learn the Tree Keeper software, but she really had to pay attention because it's on her to mm -hmm. make sure that it stays updated. So when we do tree plantings, we, when Main Street does, for instance, our Arbor Day plantings, uh, or when the uh, downtown trail trees went in, 
uh, 23 trees, I believe. Um, oh, yeah. I got that information to her, and then she gets that plugged in. Now, it's, it's fairly easy to keep an eye on those kind of plantings and removals, um, but somebody's got to be a p paying attention, you know, and the, for the homeowner who wants to plant a tree in their right of way, uh, they're encouraged to check with the planning department uh, to see if it's okay to put a tree there, um, just to make sure, of course, you always want to call before you dig and to make sure that it's not encumbering a stop sign or, or maybe there's uh, sewer lines nearby. Uh, and the plant department can provide uh, that recommended tree species list that we produce for the city. We encourage people to select from, from that list to make sure that no native species are, are being planted or that we're not planting 100 maples for every one um, sycamore, something like that. <laughs> So, Sue, I just wondered if you, if you could uh, elaborate a little more for people um, about how frequently the inventory updating would, would occur and uh, who's going to be evaluating the, uh, the health of, uh, of trees moving forward. Thanks, David. Um, when we signed the contract with Davy Tree Group to do the inventory, that included a one-year subscription uh, for to tree keeper suit sweet I just you know, was reminded that that one year subscription is about out I can't believe it mm. 2020 is just created a buzz uh, and so the city will be making a determination do we sign up for another one year five years the price point is adjusted uh, depending on uh, how many years you sign up. And uh, of course, we will certainly encourage the city to retain Tree Keeper uh, Suite and our inventory. We feel like we, we were just getting started and then COVID happened, which has obviously set everybody uh, onto uh, um, other concerns. Um, but we see the, the investment um, is certainly worthwhile. Uh, now, in terms of who who is going around and 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 just double checking inventory, uh, those street trees that are planted by residents, for instance, um, you can hire groups like Davy Tree and other uh, businesses who will do that. You know, they're contracted. They have the tree keeper suite, and so they know exactly where to go and how to walk it and how to update it. So that too is uh, an investment for the city. Um, it's, uh, it may be dependent on uh, the amount of encouragement they get from the population to uh, invest in, uh, to continue to invest in something that we've already invested in. Um, if it drops off, then we, we have to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. So uh, very grateful back in 2005, uh, Crawfordsville Parks Department did an inventory uh, for the city. It, I'm sorry, it did a management plan. It wasn't a true inventory of, of all trees, but it was something that was published. And then there it goes on on a shelf and there's just one or two copies tree keeper is available to anybody uh, in the community who wants to look in on their trees now if you're an admin you can take a deeper dive into trees and find out more information but this is something that's now available to the entire community and so there's that community buy-in and support that we hope will will grow 
Sue and David and Marco, thank you so very much, Sue, for sharing this vital information with us. We look so forward to sharing it as widely as we can with our community. And we so appreciate you taking the time and leading our city, our community to have made this happen. I know the stellar grant was the great boost, but we need that leadership. And David, you are a key part of that leadership too. And we thank you both very, very much. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time at Lunch with the League. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Arco.